Welcome back to the second part of my lecture on cancer engineering. My name is Simon Schütte. I'm a researcher at Linköping University. In the first part, I've been talking about effective needs of customers. Basically, products do evoke feelings and emotions in, in customers. And uh, I've been talking about how to put a brand based on that. There's a Japanese term which is called the kansei, roughly translated to feelings, emotions, but just as roughly. So in the second part now, I will talk about the kansei, what it is, and how can this kansei philosophy be transformed into product development processes. So stay tuned. they call it the Kansai. And that is the second part of my, my presentation here. I will go through and explain what the Kansai is. Uh, why do we use the Japanese term Kansai? Why are there no good translations? And uh, how can the, translate, the Kansai be described or even measured? So I think it's a good idea to start up with uh, the term of Kansai and uh, go take it from there. So Kansai is a, as I already mentioned, a Japanese term um, meaning something like, yeah, well, effect, emotion, but it really doesn't say it, what, what I mean in, in this context here. Uh, According to my understanding of Japanese, uh, the way of uh, where and how the term Kansai is positioned in relationship to its context, it means different things. So here we define Kansai and what it means for product development. We start up very simple. So we have two pieces of art. One is called La Mamba, the other one is called Takete. Which one is which? Well, you might have uh, guessed that's the way it is. But usually this is the easier part. What makes this piece of art be called Takete, the other one be called La Mamba? I can tell you, I've presented it to many students during the recent years. And uh, I can also tell you that uh, there were very few who were opposing that. Not, not the fact that they were presented it, <laughs> they're opposing the, the fact that this one is Lumumba, the other one is Takete. The real difficult question is then not which one is called what, but why is this one called Takete and this one called Timilamamba? Well, if I ask people, they will say Takete has these edges and Takete means somehow, yeah, has some feel towards it. Lumumba feels like more round. Huh? And, and I think that Many of you can agree with that. The question, however, is why do you agree on that? Why is that? Apparently, you have learned that in your previous life, in your, you have some type of so-called ad hoc knowledge. And that is what can say is in this context. So you have some type of ad hoc knowledge and how can that be transferred into products? How, into how can uh, terms, verbal descriptions, feelings, and so on. How do they connect to physical product properties? How does the takete sound relate to edgy? And how does lumumba uh, relate to, to roundings? And also, at what point of transformation, Lamamba might become Takete. 
so let's stay here for a while. Um, let's explore the Kansai a little bit more. What does it what does it mean? It means that the Kansai has different levels. So uh, when when you start describing a product, and usually in this uh, part of the presentation, I ask you as an audience to describe your toothpaste. And the thing is that I get very questioning faces. What do you mean by that? And uh, then I point out somebody, and this person, of course, thinks it's very awkward, but uh, this person comes up with something like fresh. And then the next person says minty. And the next person says hygienic. And the next person says uh, white. And the next person says uh, uh, healthy, and, and so on. And those words come very natural to people when they describe their products, when they describe their ways of interacting with the products. And strangely, those are adjectives. And that is what I mean by the first level of Kansai. So if you are looking on just the description of, of products or the effective description, ask people to describe their products and collect the adjectives. This is not what you actually want, but what you're really interested in is what is the general can say. What does it mean to you, this product to you or the service to you? So let's, let's stay with the toothpaste for, for a while. Uh, we can say that uh, you would get here on the lowest level, the words minty, fresh and, and so on. And you would be able to aggregate them and find, okay, here we have groups of words which belong together. What do they mean? And and so on. And in the end, you will get up with a gen, to a general can say. This general can say is something people are not aware of mostly. Why do you use toothpaste? What does your toothpaste mean to you? Toothpaste has a very existential uh, function for for people in an eff effective way. What happens if you don't use your toothpaste? Or when you don't brush teeth, you get bad, bad uh, uh, mouth health. You, you might lose your uh, your teeth. You might become unattractive, and in the end, you might be nobody wants to to be with you because it feels unhygienic and and so on. And that is the greatest fear that people have, actually being not part of the group. And that's why you use products to be part of the group. Why do you need deodorants? Functionally, there is no need, but you do that and you use them in order to smell okay or smell good for uh, and, and belong to, to a certain group. And this is something what what you what you can see in, in the general can say. What is the purpose of this product in, in, in the end? I have another example here. Uh, this is uh, a real study which have been, we have been doing a couple of years ago. We were looking at flats. Um, flats in, in terms of uh, you buy an apartment and uh, what are the dimensions which are important to you. Uh, when you produce flats or when you decorate flats, you would like to know as an architect what are, import what are the important features and uh, how can we make them uh, design them in, into new flats or apartments. Uh, what you see here again, we have a lot of adjectives collected and many of them group them together into groups, something like this, for example, generous, nice, lush might be, might be one. And then we have safe, um, home you may be something belonging to a group, maybe even affordable in quality. Um, you might have natural and Scandinavian as a group and, and so on. When you do this aggregation and then do that on different levels, I will show you later on in the presentation how you do that. You come up with three major groups. And this is safety, practicality, and lifestyle. These are the dimensions people use for deciding, do you want this product? Or you, don't, or you don't. So safety is the most important thing. So seclusion, 
can close the doors. Um, nobody will be able to spy into your windows. Uh, nobody will be able to break in into it. Um, also, some type of privacy. Um, and, and so on. All of all the things are covered by, by this group safety. Then they have the practicality. Those are those questions like uh, does my grandmother's furniture fit into my living room? Or the question how is the sunlight on the Sunday morning in my sleeping room? Will it disturb me or will it be positive in this way? And then, of, the, of course, lifestyle. And that's, of course, location. Uh, which area do I want to live in? Uh, how does the the building look on the outside? What does it say about me? And if you go back to what I had in the first part of the presentation here on on lifestyle and lifestyle products, a apartment is very much a lifestyle product. So by now I hope I have convinced you that uh, it's important to address the the customer's effective needs. That uh, the company needs to know how the customer feels about the product, what are the hidden needs, and so on. But I told you I'm an engineer. Something which is not measurable is very hard for is very hard to handle and introduce into product development methods. So what we have to do is we have to measure the can say in some way which means that we need some type of measuring methods. And uh, if we go into this here, we can see that there are different ways of actually measuring that. First, we have uh, psychological, uh, physiological uh, measurements here. This would be IMG, EKG, heart, ra uh, heart rate, skin temperature, and, and so on. Actually, you put electrodes on the human body and uh, you measure and interpret the uh, the responses. A lie detector, for example, uh, is such a machine. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, that uh, measuring or measuring up this data is um, partly not very reliable and also not really suitable for the, um, you know, how to put it, um, measuring the emotional responses. Uh, so we could go to psychological, uh, psychological um, measurements. That would be questionnaires. And uh, that's something you have probably seen before. Uh, you can use focus groups. You can interviews. You could have semantic differential scales. I come back to that in, in a while. Um, th those are psychological measurements which um, are more subtle, but on, on the other hand, uh, it might be difficult for the participants in those study to access their, their hidden needs. Those things that are unconscious in some way. Uh, but there would be something, some combination out of it where you have observational studies. People do things which they are not even aware of, but which you as observer can find out and, and you can see, um, ah, here is an effective need or here is a physical need in some way. One other methodology would be body storming. So what are the takeaways from this part? Firstly, the term can say can't be translated into other languages. It's a philosophy which is rooted in the Japanese way of thinking and the Japanese way of producing products. Also, the can say is made up out of a hierarchy of different ways to, to think of the product, of different ways to see on the product. And there are ways to quantify these hierarchy and we will be able to find out what is it the customer really wants from an effective perspective even though the customer may not be even consciously aware of that.